seizure. Sure. Yeah. May I ask if the seizure is from it? Sure. Is string theory correct? <laughs> well, I don't, well, I suppose that as soon, as far as it's gone, it's probably correct. But is it relevant to physics? Yeah, basically I'm asking that. Yeah, I don't know. There's something about the sociology of string theory that is worrisome. Let me just get rid of this. In that it grew out of the same movement that launched all that bootstrap business. Jeffrey Chu and his crew? Right, Jeffrey Chu et al. I mean, Chu didn't, I don't think, I don't think he was a really inventor, but it was that school of physics. Veneziano amplitude, for example, was the thing that stimulated the original string theory. And this was a movement in which people thought that they could do away with quantum field theory and just emphasize the basic principles of relativistic quantum mechanics. And so, and unitarian, and so they emphasized the scattering matrix and the analytic properties of the scattering matrix. And then pretty soon they had results about theories of, so they were dealing with functions of several complex variables. And then there were all sorts of, you know, just in the case of a single complex variable, there were all sorts of neat results about a function that's analytic. And in the case of this attempt to get, to do away with quantum field theory, they had functions of many complex variables and they really, it led essentially nowhere, but then it popped up as string theory, in an early form of string theory. And it was meant to be a theory of the... Hadrons, right? Right. And the thing is, it makes some sense as a theory of hadrons. And so it may be that if you have a quark and anti-quark, the force, the gluons essentially form a string between them. And when that thing spins, it's a relativistic string. And the relationship between mass and angular momentum of a relativistic string is followed by various baryon and meson resonances. And I plotted out some of this in the class notes on course 466. The very last chapter, I think, is on... Not the last chapter, the next to the last chapter is on string theory. But it's very elementary string theory. And I worked out... Which book did you use? Or did you do... These are just my own notes. But I was sort of drawing from different books. I think that we're still not yet at the level that we can derive physics from mathematics. Well, yeah, that never... I don't know if that will ever happen. It's always... It's always a rear-view mirror activity. And the problem now is there's no longer any rear-view mirror because there hasn't been... There haven't been really striking accelerator results for decades. And we'll probably get some in... We'll most certainly get some in two, three, four, five years from the LHC. So let's see. Is there... Are there any other questions? Or should we start this thing? Or have you already started it? We've already started it. Oh, great. All right. Well, what I want to do today... And I'm sorry there aren't more people here because 
the topic is pedagogically useful, namely doing these examples. So let me start, though, by two things that aren't quite examples. They are examples, but they're not examples of addition of angular momentum. I'll do those later. This is something you've probably all seen, but it's important to see it nonetheless. E to the I, theta dot, sigma over 2, which, of course, is the same thing as E to the minus I, theta dot, S over H bar, since S is H bar, sigma over 2. This thing, if you expand it, it turns out to be cosine theta over 2 minus I, theta hat dot, sigma times sine theta over 2. And the way you see that, the easiest way to see that is to just expand the, well, first of all, to notice that theta dot, sigma squared. What is it? Well, it's, let me use the summation convention, okay? If I have an index repeated, it means we sum over it over the relevant range here from 1 to 3. So we have theta I, theta J, sigma I, sigma J. And that is then theta I, theta J, delta I, J plus I, epsilon I, J, K, sigma K. But now, this part is symmetric in I and J, and this part is anti-symmetric in I and J. And so the epsilon sigma K term cancels. And so this is just theta dot, theta, or theta squared, if I take theta equal to the length of the vector theta, which is the square root of the sum of the three theta components. So when you expand this thing, E to the minus I, theta dot, sigma over 2, what you get is 1 minus I, theta dot, sigma over 2, then minus theta dot, sigma over 2 squared, divided by 2, and then you get plus I, theta dot, sigma over 2, cubed over 3 factorial, and so forth. And you re-express that as 1 minus I, theta dot, sigma over 2. And then this is, let me, I'm trying to follow my notes so as not to have any typos. Minus a half theta over 2 squared, and then plus I over 3 factorial, theta dot, sigma over, well, let me rewrite that. Let's see. I, theta over 2 squared, times theta dot, sigma over 2, and then 1 over 3 factorial, and then extra terms. And eventually, you see that this is 1 minus theta squared over 2, times a half, and then over here you get plus, or minus actually, minus I, theta half dot, sigma, and then this becomes theta over 2, minus 1 over 3 factorial, theta over 2, cubed. And you can recognize these are the first two terms of the series for cosine theta over 2, and these are the first two terms for the series sine 
theta over 2. And if you keep track of all the terms, it of course works out. This is an approximation. And um, there's a stimulus. So this is a, this is a very well-known formula that you see in all the textbooks. But curiously, there, I've never seen in any textbook, or it must be in some textbook, the corresponding formula for the three-dimensional case. And in particular, if you take the, let's see, how do I want to say it here, there's any, If we take e to the minus i theta dot, and now I'm going to write this as h bar j over h bar, just because I want to get rid of that h bar. So the angular momentum, I'm going to take, uh, in other words, I'm going to have j as um, in the following way j, the ij component of the 3 by 3 matrix jk is going to be i epsilon i j k. This effectively is the, uh, it are the generators in the adjoint representation of SU2, or they're the generators for SO3, either way you look at it. And um, then if you expand this, what you get is cosine theta minus i theta hat dot j. So J here is dimensionless. Sine theta plus one minus cosine theta, theta hat, theta hat transpose. Or if we say that R of theta is this e to the minus i theta dot J, canceling the H clause, then R I J of theta is equal to delta ij cosine theta minus sine theta epsilon ijk theta hat k plus one minus cosine theta theta hat i theta hat j. So this is um, this is the three by three matrix, and you can think of this as either SO3, or you can call it the adjoint graph of uh, SU2. And I worked out this formula actually because I was working on protein folding, and I needed to know how these various parts of the molecule would behave when there were rotations about single bonds which then rotated the whole rest of the molecule relative to the other part of the molecule. Or rotated one side of the molecule relative to the other side. And um, now normally we don't use this adjoint representation when we talk about angular momentum. We instead uh, make a similarity transformation, in fact, typically a unitary transformation, so that we have J3 diagonal, whereas none of these guys is diagonal in this case. All right, so those are two examples then. Any, any questions? Um, well, let's see. I want to figure out what to do next. There's a whole group of things to do. Um, all right, let me start writing with the examples. I had hoped that. Everybody would be here for the examples. Um, all right, let's let's first write down the basic rule that's the engine of 
theorems on addition of angular momentum, and it's j plus or minus um, on a state jm is h bar, and then it's j minus or plus m j plus one plus or minus m times the state j m plus or minus one, and of course. If m is equal to j, we showed that j plus on the state jj is zero. If m is equal to minus j, then j minus on the state j minus j is zero. Um, okay. Um, all right. I think that's that's good enough. So now let's let's consider um, a couple of cases here. Um, in fact, to make this thing more physical. Let's suppose we have a proton here, a proton there, and then we have an electron cloud here, an electron cloud there. So this is a hydrogen molecule. All right, so what's going on? Well, if we first just look at the electrons, um, what we see is that the, each individual electron is in the state spin up or spin down, and it's easier easier to write plus minus than one half minus one half, and so the you can have a state that is plus plus, and this is a state that in fact is angular momentum one z with one in the z component, and this is the direct product of these two. In other words, this is both electrons have spin up, then the the addition of angular momentum gives you a state with um, uh, m equal to 1. So spin is h bar in the z direction. And that can only be if, um, if it is uh, uh, total spin 1. But now we can act on that with j minus. And j minus on 1, 1, well, according to this rule, this will be h bar square root of one, and we're going down, so it's one plus one is two, and then this will be again two minus one is one, so this is a bit square root of two, and it will then be the state one, zero, because we're lowering m by one. But then if we write it the other way, it's j one minus plus J2 minus, acting on these two states, plus plus. And so that is J1 minus on plus times plus, plus plus times J2 minus on plus. Now we've got to apply this rule to the case J equals, uh, this is the case. This plus just means one half, one half. And so this, the first one then will be, well, for sure it's an h bar. Then it's the square root of 1 half plus 1 half is 1. 1 half plus 1 half is 1 um, minus a half. So that's a half. Okay? Times the state, and this would be the state 1 half minus a half but um, that just is the state minus, and then times the state plus. And then the same thing is going to happen over here. So we're going to have h bar plus minus over root 2. So this state is 1 over square root 2 minus plus 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 minus. And then we have I guess it must have been right. All right. Somehow the normalization is coming out right. Um, so in other words, what I'm getting from this is that one zero is I'm getting one half times minus plus plus plus. Um, and it 
should be 1 over root 2. Does anybody see what I did wrong? Let's, let's just check this part. We've got 1, 1. We're going down. So it's 1 plus 1 is unfortunately 2. And it's 2 minus 1 is 1. So that's the square root of 2. And over here, it's 1 half plus 1 half is 1. 1 half plus 1 half is 1 minus minus a half is a half. Well, 
by the Pauli exclusion principle, which we'll get to later in this course, fermions have to be in an anti-symmetric state. And so you can have them on, if you put them in the spin one state, then the space wave function has to be anti-symmetric. If you put them in the spin zero state, then the spin wave function is anti-symmetric and the space wave function can be symmetric. But if you put them in the spin one state, the spin state is symmetric and the space part has to be anti-symmetric. But having the space part anti-symmetric basically means that the density of electrons here in the center, just between the two protons, has to be zero. And in fact, that's where you want the density to be high because that's what holds the thing together. In other words, the electrons try to get as close to the two protons as possible, still respecting the uncertainty principle. So they like to cluster here. But that is in a symmetric state. So then the spin state has to be anti-symmetric because the space state is symmetric. So in fact, the hydrogen molecule in its ground state, let me just say this as one more thing about this, the hydrogen molecule in its ground state has basically a, it's the state plus minus, 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 plus, one over root two for the spins, anti-symmetric, times a wave function psi of say R1 and R2, which is symmetric. And so that's the ground state of hydrogen. And it's a little, it's slightly surprising. In fact, I'm embarrassed to mention this, that my physical intuition is so bad that when I started working on the hydrogen molecule, I assumed the opposite. And I couldn't get a good ground state energy. And so then I thought, well, maybe I have it wrong. And then of course I got the right answer. So it is tricky. In fact, I was working with a colleague who's quite distinguished. I won't mention his name at the moment. But he had it backwards. And since I was doing most of the work, he kept it backwards. He didn't want to talk to other people. So it's a little bit confusing, but this is the way it works. Any questions about this? In fact, this is more general than just hydrogen. You can say that basically a covalent bond between two atoms involves two electrons. They're in an anti-symmetric spin state and more or less a symmetric spatial state. This is way oversimplified when you generalize beyond hydrogen in its ground state. But roughly speaking, that's what these bonds are. So when chemists draw things like C, well, I've got that in the other one. N, C, C. This is the backbone of an amino acid. And then you have double bond zero here and so forth. And another bond going up and another bond going up there. And I'm leaving out the, and this one is just on the side chain. And there's a hydrogen here, hydrogen here. Anyway, so this is the basic structure of an amino acid in the protein chain. And each of these lines is two electrons in this spin state and more or less a symmetric spatial state. Of course, it's not really symmetric when you have carbon here and nitrogen there. But it's sort of symmetric when you have two carbons. If the two carbons were exactly in the same state, then it really would be symmetric. For example, in a hydrocarbon that might be able to form C and H, H and then C, H, H, and then another C here. You can imagine that this bond would be pretty much symmetric. All right, any questions about that? 
before I get back to the subject of the course. All right, so let's now add J1 equal to 1 to J2 equal to 1. Well, we know we can have the state J equal to 2, N equal to 2, which I can write as 2, 2. And what I'm going to do to distinguish the composite system, that is to say the JM case, this is JM, this is the combined, the added state. This is the, in other words, this is the basis where we have J, where we have the eigenstates are, the eigen, the operators of the diagonal are J squared, J3, or JZ if you like, and then J1 squared, J2 squared. I'm going to write them in this form, and the basis states are all 1 plus 0 minus 1 plus 0 minus, and these are eigenstates of J1 squared and J1Z, J2 squared and J2Z. Okay, so this is the top state. The top state is 2, 2, 2, 2 is equal to plus, plus. That means spin 1 up, spin 1 up, and of course I'm talking non-relativistic part, massive part. Now we act with J minus, and J minus on 2, 2 is A bar, and now that's the square root of 2 plus 2, that's this J plus M, and then the next one is 2 plus 1, which is 3, minus 2, which is 1, and so on, on to 1. So this is all together 2 H bar, 2 comma 1. That's what J minus is there. Now this is the same thing as J1 minus on plus times minus plus plus J2 minus on plus. And remember, this is a spin 1. It's not the way, it's not the spin 1 half anymore. So you have plus 0 minus. And now, what does this do? This gives us an H bar and then the square root. Well now what we have is 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 minus 1 and 0 Wait a second, I did something silly here. This is still a plus. This should have been a plus. Because we're acting on the state 2, 2, which is the same thing as the state plus, plus. In other words, this is J1 minus plus J2 minus on the state plus, plus. So this is 0 plus, plus, plus. And this is then, now what's this? This is square root of 2. So this is H bar square root of 2, 0. Okay. So what that tells us then is that the state 2, 1 is 1 over root 2 plus 0 plus 0 plus. Okay. And now we act one more time. We act with J minus on 2, 1. And following these rules, what we get is H bar square root of 3, uh, 3 minus 1, 
but then this is the same thing as J1 minus plus J2 minus acting on 2, 1, and that's 1 over square root of 2, 0 plus plus 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus. And now, so the only part of this that's really tricky is keeping these square roots right, and I don't know what happened to that square root of 2 there. Has anybody seen where the square root of 2 went? All right, well, anyway. Okay, so J minus on this, that gives us This is H bar over square root of 2, then square root of 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 minus 1, 0, 0. So that's this one acting on this one. And, oh, this is more tricky. I think I skipped a line here, so let me write this down in a little more detail. You see, now we have both of these guys acting on both of these guys. So this is 1 over root 2, and it's J1 minus on plus times 0. And then it's J1 minus on 0. Times plus, and then it's J2 minus, here, let me write it a little bit differently. And it's plus times J2 minus on 0, plus 0, J2 minus on plus. So it's all, so it's actually four terms that look like that. And now when we do the arithmetic here, what happens is we get H bar over the square root of 2 times, as I said, the square root of 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 minus 1, 0, 0. So that's this one acting on this one. And then let me do the right one now. Okay, I'm going to do this one now, where J2 minus hits the 0 state. And what that gives us is the square root of 1 plus, 1 times 1 plus 1 plus minus. And then the other two, and so that's square root of 2. And the other two are also square root of 2. So square root of 2 minus plus square root of 2, 0, 0. And so all together then, what we've got here is that J2, 0 times the square root of 6. So this state, 2, 0 then, is 1 over the square root of 6 times all this, which is, and the square root of 2 is cancel. So we have here then plus minus plus 2, 0, 0, plus minus plus. And, right. Okay, so that's the answer there. Now, any questions? Now, as we go down, the next, you can do two things here. You can go down one more time using J minus, or what's probably a little bit easier 
is you can say, well, 2 minus 2 is obviously just minus minus. Okay. Right. Both spins pointing down, and that's angular number 2 in the minus e direction. And then you can act with j plus on 2 minus 2, and that gives you h bar square root, and now you use the other formula, the top formula, and that gives you 2 plus 2 times 2 plus 1 minus 2, and that's just a 2 minus 1, and now this would be j1 plus plus j2 plus acting on minus minus, and so that is j1 plus on minus times minus plus minus times j2 plus on minus. Okay. And let me continue this equation up here. So this is h bar square root of 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 minus 1, or 2 minus 1, times 0 minus plus h bar, and it's the same thing, say square root of 2 minus 0. So then keeping track of this, what we've got is this is a square root of 4, so that's 2, and these are square root of 2, so altogether what we get is 2, 1, is 1 over square root of 2 times 0 minus plus minus 0. And this is 2 minus 1, not 2, 1. All right, now let's, this stuff is not complicated, so let's try to get this right. Is there a question? Remember, I have chocolate and other sweets. By the way, did anybody ask a question and not get a sweet last time? I think there might have been such a case. So, is there a question here? Yes. Okay, 
So that, that is the state 1-1. One, one. And now we can try, when we can find the state 1-0 by acting with J minus. So J minus on 1-1 one, one gives us H bar square root of 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 minus 1 times 1 0. And that is uh, square root of 2 H bar times 1 0. And now that's the same thing as J1 minus plus J2 minus acting on this state. Um, which is 1 over square root of 2 uh, plus 0 minus 0 plus. And, okay, so what does that give us? Let me, let me go up here with that. That gives us h bar um, over over root 2, this root 2 here, and then a bunch of terms. And the first one is the result of J1 minus acting on this, and this gives us 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1, minus 1, times 0, 0. So that's this term. Uh, that's, that's, well maybe I should have, so this is 1 over root 2, Big parentheses, J1 minus on plus zero. And then um, okay, J1 minus on plus zero, and then plus uh, plus J2 minus on zero. And then um, we have uh, minus sign J1 minus on 0 plus and then another minus sign um, 0 J2 minus on plus ok so let's just make sure this That makes sense. And the first one is this one. The next one, this one here, is going to be square root of 1 plus 0 times 1 plus 1 minus 0 on the state plus minus. And then, then what we get is the repetition of that. And we notice that this one here is square root of 2 and this one here is square root of 2. So they're all square root of 2's. So this is minus root 2 minus plus. That's when this guy acts on this, that's this term. And then this one is going to be square root of 2, 0 minus. No, 0, 0. Okay, so that's the way it looks all together. Now we see something surprising for the first time in these examples. This cancels this. And so we have the state J1, M equal to 1, and the state 1, 1 is equal to, wait a minute, that's not 1, 1, 1, 0. Um, this one here. We divide by square root of 2, and that just cancels these square root of 2's, and so altogether it's just 1 over root 2 times plus minus 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 plus. Now this looks like the, the spin 1 half case, but in fact um, this of course is this of course is m1 is equal to 1, m2 is equal to minus 1, m1 is equal to minus 1, m2 is equal to plus one. So that's that state. And the next state, j equals one, m equals minus one, 
Well, this one has to be orthogonal to this state. And so, again, we stick in a minus sign. And getting the convention right, we have 0 minus 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 0. All right. Okay. At least the part that's right. There could be a second convention of entering in this state. Finally, we have the state 0, 0 to deal with. So what is the state 0, 0? So we've got the states for spin 1. We can combine things into spin 1. Now we're going for spin 0. All right. So for spin 0, what can we have? Well, k equals 0, n equals 0, can be a linear combination of these things. So why don't you guys, while I go get a drink of tea, why don't you think of the three states, or think of all the states you can think of that could, should be entered. We're going to form a linear combination to make this state 0, 0. Tell me what states would have total n equals 0. You don't have to get the linear combination right, just give me the states. Well, we need m equal to 0. Total m equal to 0. Well, let's see then. If nobody's giving me the answer, then there's, there's a real disconnect here. What you want here is m1 plus m2 equal to 0. And the choices for m1 are 1, 0, or minus 1. The choices for m2 are 1, 0, or minus 1. So what are the possible cases? 1 minus 1, 0, 0. All right, all right. We've got 1. 1 minus 1. 0, 0. And minus 1, 1. Minus 1, 1? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. I'm going to return it. All right. Is there anything else? I don't think so. But these work. All right. Okay. So, um, now I wrote that, unfortunately, I switched notation on you. What this, uh, so let me just rewrite it in the notation that I have been using here. This is plus minus. That's the way I've been writing it, thinking that this was a simple notation. I don't know if it is. In any event, this state has to be orthogonal now to this state, which also has n equal to 0. And it has to be orthogonal to this state, which also has m equal to 0. And it's automatically orthogonal to all the other states, because they don't have m equal to 0, total m equal to 0. OK. So first of all, we have the inner product. 0 is 2, 0 with 0, 0. So this is our state, 0, 0. And what is that? Well, that is, we can leave off the overall factors. That is plus minus plus 2, 0, 0 plus minus plus x plus minus plus y, 0, 0 plus z minus plus. OK, 
Okay, what does that tell us? Well, this answer here is 0 then is equal to x plus 2y plus z. So that's one constraint on x, y, z. Now, it also has to be, be orthogonal, though, to the state 1, 0, which is over here. So we have 0 is equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, which is plus, minus, 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 plus on this state. And we can leave out the 0, 0 on the right here, so we just have x plus, minus, plus z, minus, plus, because 0, 0 obviously is orthogonal to these and it's not going to come through. And so this one is equal to, says 0 is equal to x minus z. And that's kind of interesting because if we add these two equations together, we get y equals 0. And this equation tells us then x is equal to z. All right, I screwed up again. So let's see, there are, what is, the, no, I, adding these together, you don't get y equals 0. Hello? Yes. 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 Could you do me a favor? Could you, could you fax me the results? Seven seven one five two zero. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Obviously, when you read these two equations, you don't get y equal to zero, which is the wrong answer. Um, what you do is you set x equal to z using this equation, and then you have the equation two x plus two y is zero. So x equals z, and x equals y. Thank you. Duh. x equals minus 1. Thank you. And looking at the notes, what we find is 0, 0 then is equal to 1 over square root of 3 times plus minus minus 0, 0 plus minus plus. Now you can see this obviously works because 0, 0 is orthogonal to this because the, I'm sorry, it's orthogonal to this because the plus minuses are symmetric here and they're anti-symmetric there. And here it's orthogonal to this one over here because you get two pluses from the end terms and one minus here with a factor of two. And so the whole thing is uh, orthogonal. The one over root three is the right normalization because um, if you just take the inner product of itself, you get three ones and divide by three. Okay, so that's that example. Um, we'll do this spin one half, one that was too trivial for me to bother to work out in my notes after class. And now I think what I'll do is um, show you something uh, very physical, but uh, uh, a different application of the algebra of angular momentum. And this application was invented, as far as I know, I mean, it might have been invented by people prior to him, but the person who made it, whose, whose name is most attached to it is uh, Eugene uh, Wigner. Uh, Wigner. Um, and uh, by the way, I once heard a lecture from him. It was very interesting, but it was a terrible lecture. Anyway, 
brilliant man, Thomas Nobel Prize and all that, wrote a marvelous book on group theory. It often turns out that people who write very good books give terrible lectures. Um, my own feeling has been that, well, all right, I'll just talk about the dead. Um, Dirac, well, actually, Dirac gave a pretty good lecture. I remember hearing a lecture by Dirac um, years ago, and uh, he was well delivered and quite interesting. His idea was that you couldn't have a number as small as um, Newton's constant for gravity uh, related to the rest of physics, and so it must be that it had something to do with the age of the universe. That was a big tangent that I was raising for. What Wigner uh, introduced was isospin. And isospin has the same algebra as angular momentum. In other words, I sub i conjugator I sub j is equal to I epsilon I j k plus sum over k. J k oh, not a j, this is an i. Um, notice there's no h bar here because um, Wigner decided that, uh, or whoever did this, decided uh, let's not stick in the h bar and then pull it out uh, because it was coming in somewhat artificially to begin with. What he, what, what Wigner noticed was that the proton and the neutron um, behaved more or less the same in scattering experiments apart from electro from electromagnetic interactions. And so this was so he said, well this that the proton then can be a state one half one half and the neutron a state one half minus one half. And much later, maybe 30, 40 years later, we came to understand that this was because the proton was a state of two up quarks and a down quark. A neutron was a state of one up quark and two down quarks. And um, these up and down quarks behave under the strong interactions pretty much the same way, apart from a very tiny difference in mass. Um, and the neutron and the proton only differ by a few uh, electron volts in mass. Uh, one is, I don't know, 938, the other 939, something like that. And um, so, um, at this time they were doing, they had discovered the pi meson, and they noticed that there was a pi meson, a pi plus meson, and a pi minus meson. And so this was, these three states were regarded as uh, the state one and then uh, plus zero minus in the notation I've been using, and we can call these guys plus and minus. If you keep in mind that we mean isospin one half here, isospin one there. Um, and uh, so these, now you can take two protons together, so now we're getting into addition of. The, the rule, since the algebra is the same as the algebra of rotations, the algebra of SU of isospin is the same as the algebra of the rotation group. And so what we have is we have the state 1, 1, which is two protons, the state 1, 0, which is um, 1 over root 2 proton neutron plus neutron proton. This is from the example at the beginning that I screwed up and didn't have the right one over the two here. One minus one is neutron, neutron. So there's a triplet here. But now if you look at the bound states of a neutron and a proton, there's one that's actually stable. And it's called proton and neutron. Really yeah, what's the bound state called of a proton and neutron? Deuterium. That's right. So this bound state called deuterium, and it's written as D, same symbol as the down quark, but what do you do? 
Anyway, so this is a neutron-proton state. And um, in fact, it's the following linear combination, 1 over root 2, uh, Pn minus Np. So this is the isospin 0 combination. And uh, it's a singlet. And what this leads one to believe, then, is that the interaction Hamiltonian, of course, it's a kinetic part, plus a potential part, the potential part would be some coupling constant G times I1 plus I2 squared, where this is, say, some positive number, so let me write it as G squared. And so what you see here is that if you take in the triplet state, so 1m, this is the, the, the three triplet states here, the, the potential v, I'll call this k plus v, this v, 1m, is then 1m, uh, just i1 plus i2 squared, so this is 1m just i squared to the, the combined isospin. And this is then 1 times uh, 1 times 2 times 1m, 1m, which is to say 2. Um, and then there's a factor of g squared. So so 2g squared. On the other hand, if you take the single state, well, that's just 0, 0, g, i squared, 0, 0, and that is just 0. So the energy of the single state is lower than that of the um, uh, triplet state, and that's um, that has that. That's the basic reason why deuterium is bound and, uh, and the, uh, the other states are not. So it's a state that's anisometric and isospin, and um, consequently it's symmetric in, in space spin. And, um, All symmetric in space and also symmetric in spin, so therefore it's a spin one. Um, if anybody has a wallet card or something like that, you might check the spin of the material and make sure it's one. Okay, so that, and, and notice that this uh, interaction here, if the, the, this interaction guarantees that. The Hamilton commutes with isospin, which is called minus tax. Okay, now let me do uh, one more example of isospin. What's the time? Is that 447? Time passes when we're having fun. All right, um, I think I'd better quit. There's no point. Students may have other. You guys you want to see the other example, or shall I quit? I think it's better to quit because you may have other points. <laughs> what do you think? Or it depends on the length. I mean, you know. it's, it's a page. I'm okay with it. I don't know if it is. All right, we'll go on a little bit. So we're considering, let's consider, consider some scattering. So here are two processes. Proton, proton goes to deuterium plus a pi plus. Proton plus proton goes to deuterium plus a pi naught. Okay. Well, the um, the proton 
neutron state, which is, let us say, plus minus, this is equal to clearly one half plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And which is to say this is 1 over root 2 times the 1, 0 minus the 0, 0 state. In other words, that's the trouble with this notation. Okay, so this is, in other words, this is the triplet, and this is the singlet of the neutron and proton state. So Pn is a linear combination of the triplet and the other, which is what we saw here. You see Pn plus Np is 1 to 0, 1, 0, and so forth. Okay, so now we imagine that the scattering matrix commutes with isospin. And so what do we have? We have P pi plus SPP is, this is just 1, 1, S, 1, 1, whereas D pi 0 S Pn is, well, D pi 0, this D is an isosinglet, so these are all, this is 1, 1, this is 1, 0. So this state is 1, 0 S Pn, and Pn is this thing, which is 1 over root 2, 1, 0, minus 0, 0. So this thing is equal to 1 over root 2 times 1, 0 S, 1, 0. And since S commutes with isospin, we can argue that these two states are the same. These two amplitudes are the same. And that is to say, this is the same as that. And so one expects then the cross-section for PP goes to D pi plus divided by the cross-section for Pn goes to D pi 0 to be the ratio of these two things squared, which is to say D pi plus S PP divided by D pi 0 S Pn squared, which is then 1, 1 S, 1, 1 over 1 half. Oh, the point is that, let me just, I left out one step. This is 1 over root 2, 1, 0 S, 1, 0, because since S commutes with isospin, it can't change, it can't change the total value of the, of the isospin. So this term is 1, 0 S, 0, 0 is 0. And so this is 1 over root 2, 1, 1, 0 S, 1, 0 squared. And so this altogether should be 2, unless I've inverted the square root. My notes have it the other way around. No, this is right. This is 2. Okay, so, all right, so let's, 
let's quit. And um, I'll put some new homework. So the, the homework that's due is due on Monday, and the, um, I'll put some new homework. And I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give two sets of homework problems because some people can kind of do the homework really quickly, and other people have a different background and do it more slowly, or they have more things to do. So I'm going to have some extra credit problems and some normal problems. And um, people who just get all the normal problems right will get a very good grade. People who get do the normal problems and the extra credit problems, I'll add various pluses uh, to the grade. So I'll play with that. Okay, so now those of you who, let's say you're going to turn off the machine at some point, right? Those of you